Thank you very much for coming. We've got, um, we're very lucky today. We have Dennis Purcell from Aisling Capital who's here today. Um, I'll let Dennis introduce himself, but at a very high level, Dennis spent a number of years uh, as a senior, senior member of the team at H&Q, uh, doing healthcare investment banking. And then in 2002, two, two, one, yep. 2001, uh, founded Aisling Capital, has been the senior managing partner there ever since. Um, Aisling is a 1.7, there's 1.7 billion under management. Um, so it's one of the larger in the space. It's been very active, um, and we're very lucky to have him here today. So this will be a Q&A. We're going to go through uh, some of our own questions, some of the questions you submitted, and we're going to try and leave a lot of room at the end for, uh, for folks to ask questions on their own. Great. Dennis, thanks for joining us today. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So why don't we start off, if you could tell us a little bit about the fund, mm -hmm. um, how you started it, how it's evolved over the years. Um, and where, what areas you're looking at today as uh, high potential areas for investment? Sure, sure. We got started with uh, George Soros, actually, who doesn't care that much about healthcare, He's more involved in kind of other, uh, other activities. I just heard the other day, he, uh, um, last 10 years, he's averaged uh, um, $650 million of uh, charitable contributions per year. But he didn't really have any healthcare. So he said, I'll give you some money to start a healthcare fund, and then you use my money to leverage it with other money. So we started a fund uh, and closed it in 2002, and we've done three funds so far. Our last fund was at the end of 2008. That fund was um, $650 million. And then we're in the process of thinking about our next fund. Uh, we're venture capital, all life sciences, so we're not a hedge fund trading stocks day in and day out. Our job generally is to you know, identify promising technologies. Um, you go on the boards. You usually hold the companies for three to five years or four to six years. Um, uh, and then hopefully somebody at Big Pharma will buy them or you take them public or, or the like. So that's different um, you know, than being a hedge fund where you're buying and selling Amgen stock or Merck stock day in and day out. We're much more um, hands-on. <clears throat> and you know, generally the way it happens, uh, I'll, I'll use Columbia as an example, even though Columbia is not an investor. Uh, <laughs> you pass the hat. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all this, you know uh, our investors that are in these funds are people like state pension funds, um, New York City firefighters, Duke University, Welcome Trust, State of Pennsylvania, blah, blah, blah. And what they do is they have a, a, uh, um, their endowment, and they take about 5 or 6% of it and put it into other asset classes and private equity or venture capital is another asset class. And what they're trying to do is beat the um, stock market or the bond market by a certain percentage because they have their own obligations. So CalPERS is a big investor, and it's a big question for CalPERS because they haven't generated enough of a return to pay their retirees. So they're <laughs> really in flux about how do we generate this return. And around the world today, there's um, 70, Mike Milken says there's $70 trillion that's earning less than 2% a year. So there's an enormous amount of capital kind of sitting on the sidelines. And, you, and all these you know, New York City firefighters have their obligations to the firefighters. And they have to figure out a way on their endowment to juice their returns. Hence, they invest in things like real estate, venture capital, uh, and, and the like. So. Um, as I mentioned, we did, we've done three funds. These funds, generally what happens is you uh, raise the fund, um, take five years to invest them, and then the next five years to try to get rid of them, um, and then move on to the next fund. Um, uh, you know, what's hot, and so that's a little bit of the background about how this business works. And um, um, really the leader in this business was Yale. Yale way back when took about 30% of their endowment and put it into alternative investments. And at the time, they thought they were crazy. And over a 15 or 20 year period, this guy named David Swenson who did it, Swanson who did it, um, you know, had superior returns for Yale. And that enticed other universities to start to do more in the alternative um, um, 
investment space. The challenge, the challenge yeah. in life sciences today is that when you start a company, it takes a while for it to mature and generate value, and yet your limited partners are looking for returns um, in a less of a time frame. So there's a little bit of a tension between building a company and um, trying to get money back to the limited partners as fast as you can. Um, have you seen those, those LPs, especially the traditionally the pension funds and the university endowments that were investing in the space, um, has the state of returns across the, in, across the healthcare VC industry changed their priorities or their willingness to put this money at risk? Well, we went through a, a long period where there were really subpar returns and people really soured on venture capital and they soured on biotech. And the people that liked, tech, liked venture capital, what they would tell me is, look, in technology, every once in a while you'll get a uh, what's up. <laughs> um, yeah. And you don't get those you know, quick $20 billion hits in healthcare. You fail at the same rate, but you don't have the same upside. So you don't, we don't see the Googles in biotech, or we don't see the Amazons in biotech. So up until about a year ago, when the, when the sector got very, very hot, the LPs were a little down on the sector. It took too long. It cost a lot of money. You know, on the tech side, um, it didn't cost as much to develop a product as it did on the biotech side. So it's been a little bit of an education process, and I'm, I'm not sure yet whether they've changed their mind and decided that maybe this is a sector we should be back into because clearly we're in a, uh, um, a great mode right now. And, you know, a couple things that have happened is that it, um, the science throughout the 2000s really advanced and the stock market just didn't realize it. If you look at what's going on in cancer, it's really remarkable and people just don't realize it. <clears throat> um, and I think people began to realize the progress that was made and then it attracted generalist investors. Um, this is a very specialized space, but in the last year, you could be a generalist investor, invest in an IPO, and the stock just go up like that, and then you invest in the next one. Um, and, then, and then the last thing that happened in the last year is that we have saw a number of product launches where they exceeded analyst expectations. And in the past, people would say first year sales of 60 million, and it come in at 30, and the stock would get crushed. And, Nobody wanted to be around for the launch of a product, and all of a sudden, the launches of the product were going pretty well. So all of a sudden, the science, the Wall Street caught up with where the science was. We had quite a bull market, and we're probably, you know, kind of close to the top right now. If you look at the big, guy, the big biotech companies, the Amgens and the Genentechs, and not, not Genentech, but Gilead's and Regeneron's, they're kind of priced to perfection. And the other thing that's happened is, is that the, the interplay between pharma and biotech, the, the, the lines have really kind of crossed. Bristol-Myers Squibb, for all intents and purposes, is a biotech company. And Amgen, for all intents and purposes, is a pharmaceutical company. Mm -hmm. So the lines are blurring. But I think what we've seen is we've seen a year of catch up of the last 10 years, again, where science caught, Wall Street caught up with the science, generalists came into the sector, and the sales are doing uh, pretty well on launches. So it sounds like that's mm -hmm. a pretty good time to be raising a new fund then. Well, that's what we'll, we'll test that. <laughs> we'll, so we'll as, test. as a seasoned investor with a fund this large, <laughs> when you think about raising a new fund, mm -hmm. um, how, do you, how do you think about what's the right amount to raise? Is it driven by the demand or driven by how fast you can play that, how much money you think you can put to work in five years? Yeah, our, the, 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 um, if you look at the big leverage buyout shops, they're in a lot of different businesses, Blackstone, Carlisle, and the like. Our business is tough to scale. So we were very, very fortunate <coughs> in the third fund. We won't be as fortunate this time, but the last time where we were way oversubscribed. But the question was, where do you put the money? Um, and we, we don't find enough opportunities. We'd have to transform ourselves. If we took a $2 billion, we'd have to transform ourselves into a leverage buyout shop. Mm. So, you know, probably with venture cap, what the LPs are saying is that kind of a $350, $400 million fund you can put to work, but once it gets bigger than that, you know, you, you, you just can't give a new entrepreneur $30 million out of the box. 
I mean, you kind of dribble the money in, and the you know, big money doesn't come until phase two or phase three. Uh, um, so we, we've actually found it somewhat difficult to get um, the money to work mm -hmm. at our size fund. Are um, you, have yeah. you seen, do you have a sense of, um, for, in, for VCs that haven't been quite so lucky yeah, or yeah. smart in this, or, or that are just getting started, <laughs> um, for to play in the space that you play in, in life sciences, is there sort of a minimum size fund you think is feasible? I'm setting aside the angel markets, which we'll come back to in a bit. Yeah, um, it, it, it's. T I think that if you're doing a fund, it has to be a couple hundred million dollars, and the, and the reason is that you just can't rely. It used to be a, ver a really gentleman's game. You did the angel, you did the series A, you did the series B, you did the series C, you did the IPO, all at es escalating rounds. Well, what's happened in recently, until the last nine months or so, is that there's a lot of down rounds. People don't have the money. We found, we thought that for every dollar we invested, we needed a dollar in reserves. And I think, you know, I think now we think that for every dollar we invest, we should have three or four dollars in reserves. Because if Wall Street turns on a dime here and then starts not liking the sector for the next five years, um, you got to support your companies. And, they, and, they, and there's this uh, new notion that has cropped up, which is called pay to play. And what that means is that if you have a small fund and you invest in the Series A and you don't invest in the Series B because you don't have enough money, you automatically get wiped out or you get converted to common. So there, there is a minimum size you need to be able to play in the, in the um, sector. Um, so and we've seen a lot of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No. And we, and we found, and what we found with the smaller funds over the years have been they've tended to then invest, invest in early stage. And the early stage, unless there's quick milestones, the early stage is, you know, takes a while. Um, it, and, 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 you know, if it's, if it's uh, your own money or, you know, if it's if it was all George Soros' money, he can wait for as long as he wants to wait for you know, Columbia University doesn't have all the time in the world to wait to see whether, you know, this angel round's going to play out. So that's been a challenge. Mm. It's interesting because we are, I, I was, uh, Carl Goldfisher from, from Bay City Capital had said recently that they've had uh, what he would describe as a barbell strategy where right. they've been doing a lot of investing at the, at the very beginning stages and a lot of investing at the end, but they've actually found the middle to be the hardest point to invest. Um, would you say, how would you describe Asia's uh, general philosophy? I, I would say we're on the b one end of the barbell at the very end. We, we like, uh, or we attempt to be the last money in. So with our size, we have to write 20 or $30 million checks. I think what ba uh, 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 Warren uh, was referencing is a West Coast VC firm called Bay City Capital. And, um, and, and, and up in Boston, they do this too. They <coughs> throw $500,000, a million dollars, and they'll th throw it at 15 companies and then kill them very early and the ones that are working continue to fund. And it's an interesting strategy and it's, the venture world is, is kind of, uh, mo the, the center of the venture world has moved from the west coast to the east coast, mm -hmm. I, in my judgment. Um, the, uh, it used to be San Diego um, and that's dead. It used to be San Francisco, by and large, there's not a lot going on there. Um, so you get really Boston, which has great early stage investors, venture capitalists, and New York tends to be later stage. So one of the things um, we're trying to do is we're trying to figure out how a fund like ours can actually play uh, and fill a role in the early stage. It's pretty well filled up in Boston with companies like Polaris and Third Rock and uh, Atlas Ventures and others. Um, and we don't really have those kinds of funds in New York. So we're trying to figure out, is there a role for us to play in that, in that uh, um, ecosystem? Right. See, while you're mentioning ecosystems, so there's obviously been a very exciting time in New York City over the last five to 10 years. Um, as someone who grew up here, it's hard for me to, to, to recognize parts of the city today um, in terms of the transformation they've done, just as a place to live, setting aside the, uh, their role as a, as a tech sector. Um, clearly, the Mayor Bloomberg had a lot at stake at turning this into a real uh, capital for startups and trying to rival Boston and, 
uh, Cambridge, the Silicon Valley, San Diego. Um, and to some degree, you see some of that starting to, to pay off in, in the East River Science Park and others, and the accelerator, uh, uh, Seattle Accelerator possibly coming to New York. Where do you see New York's competitive advantages um, in this space? Do you see this catching as a sector for life sciences? Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. I mean, and, and certainly on the tech side, he's done, he's done a wonderful job. Um, on, uh, we don't know where de Blasio is in the whole life sciences world. We just don't know. Um, but there's been tremendous, there's really been tremendous progress <coughs> in the last 10 years. And, it, and, and uh, the complaints are getting kind of knocked down one by one. The deans of the medical schools now, you know, like at Rockefeller, at Cornell, at Memorial, all were in um, the biotech industry. And they're all kind of coming together with a united vision that they didn't have five or seven years ago or 10 years ago. And then we add Alexandria Center down there by NYU, and as Lauren said, some of the incubators that are coming. All of a sudden, um, uh, it, it's starting to gel. Now, the, you know, in, I, if they tell me, uh, you know, if you're in Boston, at Kendall Square, the entire biotech industry, you know, you can just walk around and you meet everybody for breakfast and lunch and in between, and we don't have that here, so we haven't built a real community here yet. We don't have a voice. Um, if you go to San Diego, there's a voice. There's a thing called Biocom, and, and it works up in, in, in the Mass Bio Council up in uh, Massachusetts. Works. We don't have a voice here that's the go-to person to put the whole thing together, but the bits and pieces are coming. So, for example, there's a request for a proposal out for um, a fund that Bloomberg wanted to start, which is a um, hundred million dollar fund for early stage startups in New York City. And people have started to do the analysis that says, um, look at all the companies that could have stayed in New York that moved to the West Coast, or you know, you know, Amgen's lead molecule came from Memorial Sloan Kettering, and you know, nobody ever thinks of Amgen is a, a New York company. So. Um, Bits and pieces are starting to come together, and I think the most important thing is that we're starting to see successful companies, um, companies like Regeneron or Accorda and things like that. And, and what happened in, say, in San Diego, why that became a hub was that there was a company called Hybertech that was sold to Eli Lilly, and the top 10 executives then went out and started 10 different companies, and then those companies got sold to the next 10, and all of a sudden, if you look at the lineage of everybody in San Diego, it all goes back to Hybertech. And we don't really have that here, the serial entrepreneur environment. But one of the things that's interesting about New York is that there's a lot of people that are kind of late 50s, or early 60s, or you know, 50, whatever. Your kids just went to college. You want to move to New York. And I'm noticing now people um, that want to live here that are pretty serious biotech people. So there's a company called Onyx that just sold to Amgen for $10 billion, a guy named Tony Coles. And uh, you know, Tony's now moving to New York. And Tony's a great spokesperson for the uh, industry. And there's five or six of them. So what, if we start to build kind of mentorship, we start to build the fund, we start to have the facil facilities, the incubators. Um, I just think we need a united voice. And we're getting there. We're not there yet. So I see uh, uh, Sam C is in the back. I would of the room. say just as a, in Cambridge, there's 170 um, biotech companies. One of the things we have in New York that I'm, I'm I'm interested in is that if you get your if you get your PhD here, there's not a lot of places to go. Hmm. You know, whereas if you're in Boston, you got Novar, you got the big pharma guys there. You have 160 companies sitting in Cambridge. You have the venture community. You have you have all kinds of op. You have you know all kinds of options, and here what we have I think is a lot of people that study here want to stay here, and we have to figure out how to give them a good uh, career opportunity, and that's some you know another kind of piece of the puzzle. That makes sense. So we're starting to see some. I, I was mentioning Sam in the back. Maybe Sam just raised your hand. So Sam C, a faculty member in, in uh, biomedical engineering here at Columbia, also recently uh, the founder of Harlem Biospace, which is a biotech incubator right in our backyard, just a couple of blocks away. Um, and you're seeing more, whether it's in healthcare or others, you're seeing more of these um, very early stage incubators and accelerators popping up. Um, 
I think historically New York's had a hard time both starting companies in the life science sector and getting them to stay here as they grow. It seems like there's a lot of people trying to tackle the first part of that, which is getting the companies to start here. Um, what do you think New York needs to do to get them to stay? Um, <clears throat> success breeds success, and I think that people want to stay mm. where there's other successful people that they can talk to and develop a community, and that's where I'm envious of Boston. I mean, you know, you go and there's plenty of people to talk to. Um, it's, it's I'm, I'm, you know, for example, I know the, the uh, venture community in Boston is very tight. The venture community here, we're all friends, but you know, it's not a tight knit community where we go out for drinks or dinner or once a month or something. So, I think that um, being around other successful startups and what you know, one thing leads to another. So one thing that we've seen um, in the Harlem, you know, it's a great, great idea, great space. Good luck with it. Yeah. So one thing we've seen more of, I'm uh, uh, curious of your perspective on, we've seen the, uh, the big biopharma companies launching their own strategic investment arms. Um, and I, I'm interested in your take as a professional investor. Uh, what do you think is driving that change now? And also, does this present any unique challenges or opportunities as a large VC fund working in the same space? Um, Sure. Mo I mean, most big pharmaceutical companies and biotech companies have their own venture fund. And about five or six years ago, they were, or ten, I'll call it ten years ago, they were started as, as <coughs> arms. Well, I'll pick on Novartis. Um, you know, find me stuff that we want to sell at Novartis. And more and more, they've become a little bit independent of the parent company. So the, the, they've become very important forces in the industry because they used to be second-class citizens. If you couldn't get somebody else to invest, you went to a corporate venture fund. Mm -hmm. Today, they're, you know, they're right there. They have the capital, and they're attracting very good people. So I think that, the, uh, I think that um, you know, in, in, in many ways, you could argue the traditional venture capital model is going to be extinct because the pharmaceutical industry is cutting deals with universities. If you, you saw Takeda do this with Rockefeller and Memorial, um, plus the pharma then they have their own venture arms. And the question becomes, as an independent venture capitalist, is there a real need for us? And it's going to be even, it's going to get even more interesting because the disease foundations are going to start their own venture funds. Mm. So multiple myeloma is pretty close now to having their venture fund focused on multiple myeloma. And the, the, the corporate venture funds are getting more and more money from their parent companies. So I think they're here to stay and they're important. Hmm. I don't know if any, I, I can't think of any university that has started a venture fund. Oh, well, actually a number of universities have venture funds. Um, like, most of them, so most of them yeah. are focused, uh, I think very few of them are focused in the biopharma space. Maybe that's Just because yeah. the, the capital you need to put at work is, Too is high. really large. Um, and most of them have a sort of, uh, uh, more of a faculty and student support model, by and large, from what we've seen. Um, there's very few that are out there from a pure returns perspective. But right. actually switch, let's maybe switch to the entrepreneurs. First. So I know there were a number of entrepreneurs in the audience or would-be entrepreneurs. Um, one, of the free, one of the questions we got most often when we solicited the group was, um, obviously, Aisling over the years has heard, uh, I'm guessing, thousands and thousands of pitches um, from companies that would love to take advantage of some of the capital you've raised. Um, are, there, uh, are there common mistakes that you think entrepreneurs make when trying to raise their first round, either in terms of the pitches or in terms of the way they're structuring uh, what they're asking for the money for? Um, yeah, th yeah, that, and that list is a long list, um, uh, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, you, you know, I think that, uh, uh, and, and this, is a, this is a criticism of our industry, which is our attention span is not that long just because you have so many people coming through the door. So what I find is entrepreneurs come in and the first tw you know, 25 minutes into it and I still don't get it. You know, like what, what, what are you trying to do? So I would say what, some of the mistakes we see, um, uh, 
not being able to articulate the value proposition, having, having something that's more like a science project than a real company, um, not having a sense of the real world, who else is out there, who's the competitors, what, you know, what, are, what are they doing, not having a sense for the risk. I mean, one of the things that's pretty interesting to me is, you know, we get it wrong most of the time. I mean, we, we're big boys and girls, and um, if, you don't, if, if you can't tell me the risk on the first meeting, I'm going to find it out in the second or the third, I'm going to be irritated because, you know, you, didn't, you weren't up front. We'll find it out anyways, and, and everything has warts on it. So it's one of those, um, you know, our, my, our job is a pretty easy one, which is to take, a, a easy uh, to explain, which is, you know, take a dollar from Columbia and give them back two dollars. And, you know, how we get there is our problem. So I see, a, I see a, lot of, uh, um, a lot of that to just, um, uh, and, and not really understanding uh, the people you're pitching to. I think that, um, I think it's important to at least know who the audience is and, you, and, you, and you, the value proposition you got to get. You know, somebody came in the other day and, I, I mean, I never say anything and people should ask, you know, how much time do you have? And we had like an hour and, and we talked about um, the Knicks for 10 or 15 minutes and then we went through, an, you know, another 30 MRIs that showed some tumors. You know, I, like, I got it. I see the tumor shrinking. Um, you know, and all of a sudden there's like 10 minutes left and we're not even at the heart of the matter yet. And, you know, it was a waste of time. So it was, um, you know, come in crisp, tell us what the warts are, and tell us how one dollar is going to turn into two. Um, and, and, in, and increasingly, the, and increasingly, um, and this is not so much for the begin. well, it, it is important for the beginning. Um, you know, it used to be proof of concept was a, you know, great inflection point. And then getting into the clinic was a great inflection point. And then it became, well, phase three is really the inflection point. Then it became approval. And today, one of the questions we have to ask ourselves, and we haven't done a good job about it yet, is who the hell is going to pay for all this stuff? You know, so you could have the greatest idea in the world, and I'm now starting to spend you know a quarter of my time in the payer world, and you know it, that's a tough world. And so far, the last 12 cancer drugs approved, 10 of them have price tags of over $100,000. You know, how long is that going to last? And you know, we, you, at the very beginning, Lauren, you, you mentioned kind of hot areas. The hot areas last year were cancer and uh, orphan diseases because they, f they kind of flew under the uh, radar mm. of, the, of the payers. But what's happening to the payers is they're doing a really good job on the, on the traditional drugs, you know, the Lipitors of the world and, you know, the stuff we all take every day. And where their costs are skyrocketing are on specialty drugs. So now it's not only a question of, can I get this device or drug approved, but can I get it paid for? And that's a question that five years ago we didn't really have to ask. Once we got approval, we thought you know we we could cross home the uh, uh, goal line, but now the goal line is reimbursement. So it's getting a little bit harder, and a good idea now has to have other dimensions to it in order for it to get uh, funded. But but you know, but now the the, the the, the good news is, and you, uh, you hit on this a little bit, uh, you know, kind of where we headed a, a, a bit. I think one of the things that uh, we're starting to see, and clearly we're starting to see it in cancer, is, you know, the whole world of personalized medicine. And so the hope is that we can stratify patients that are going to respond to certain um, treatments, and therefore the clinical trials can be smaller and not, you know, not like this and, right. and show the effect. So, you know, the age of the blockbuster might be over. I mean, probably 10 years from now, what we're gonna see is a bunch of $500 million products and, you know, less Lipitors of 12 billion that only work on half the people that take it. So, um, you know, if we, can make, if we can move the ball down the field on personalized medicine, that may take some of the pressure off. Uh, and, and I, you know, when I talk to the, when I talk to the uh, Payers, um, 
you know, they're, he they're heading clearly toward <clears throat> we're only going to pay you if the patient's cured. So, you know, if, you, if, you give, if I have prostate cancer and, and I take your drug and I end up not being cured of prostate cancer, they're not going to reimburse the manufacturer. So mm -hmm. the world in terms of downstream is changing so much. And I think that, <clears throat> you know, and, and, you know for, for, for this audience, you know, a, a good idea is a good idea, but the world's more complicated than it was 10 years ago. So speaking of good ideas that are possibly changing, like that play into that world, um, it, the shift to personalized medicine, obviously, it, 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 there's a number of plot, there's no doubt a number of platform technologies um, or approaches, technologies that enable new approaches uh, that could play a leading role in that space. Um, are you looking at any companies that are enabling that change as opposed to necessarily just taking advantage of uh, new drugs? Well, I, I, think that, I think that one of the things that's coming back in vogue are companion diagnostics. So the whole diagnostic field has become more important. And right now at Big Pharma, uh, um, I think the statistic is 60% of all drugs being worked on have a companion diagnostic. So I think that might be a field that um, is going to speed up personalized medicine a little bit. Hmm. Any um, digital health companies in your portfolio? No, we're not there yet. We're not there yet. We, I mean, we have to get there. We made an investment in a electron natural language processing company and EHR um, electronic health records company, and um, it's going okay, but it's going slower than we thought. And some of our brethren have hired healthcare IT people you know, specifically, um, and I haven't seen it be that successful yet. There's a part of me that says maybe the way we should play it is a little bit like the tech side, which is, and it's something that Allison talks about, is the um, uh, spreading your bets around mm. because I, I can't pick the winner yet. So I know it's important and I know it's coming. I don't know how to pick the winner. You know, should you just put you know a lot of chips on the table and then hope one of them really takes off. But uh, um, you know, people up in, like in Fidelity, for example, they have a bunch of people now that are in healthcare IT. Uh, Venrock is doing the same thing. So uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a shift in our thinking from will this phase two work to reimbursement, healthcare IT, you know, the broader health, how's it fit into the broader healthcare system? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I, I read a lot of uh, stuff. I'm, I, I'm yet, and there was an article this morning which I thought was fair at best, uh, you know, I don't know yet who's going to win under the ACA. You know, there's got to be, there's got to be some winners, big winners there, and some big losers there. Um, you know, and the question is, are there other parts of healthcare other than developing phase two drugs that are more interesting to kind of start companies around? Hmm. So let's go, I, I'm going to do a few more questions and then we'll take questions from the audience. Um, I want to come back to funding for early stage entrepreneurship. Um, so we have a number of angel investors in the audience or people who work with angel groups. When you look at a company that has previously raised money from, an angel, from angels, uh, does that impact your decision to do follow-on investment positively or negatively or in any particular way? Any risks? Um, Alice and I, and I should introduce my colleague, Allison Rinderly. She's in the front row here, so I should have done this earlier. I apologize. Uh, Alice and I, um, uh, we're at this morning at an angel thing for an hour or two and uh, early stage company and they had one of the in orthopedics and they had an angel that was really really well known in orthopedics investing over the years and I th and that really grabbed my attention I'm like oh, wow this is early and it, and these guys came into it um, I don't th I think it doesn't impact it positively or negatively I think the question becomes with uh, angel investing, um, uh, does the capital structure get too screwy where all of a sudden you have you know, 25 investors and they have, everybody has their own rights and the like. But I, 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 will, I will go to this question in a different way, which is there was a thing called the Jobs Act that may, you may be familiar with, which was enacted last year, which really made it easier for companies to raise capital. Um, and we don't know 
how many companies are on file to go public because you can now file and not tell anybody and then go out and test the waters and come and see us and see if you're interested or not interested. And if you want to go forward, then you go public and print the prospectus, et cetera. Um, there's a bunch of, uh, um, one of the things that I think is, is going to play out somehow is in the United States, there's 9 million accredited investors that have the you know, made 200,000 last year, have a net worth of a million or something. Um, Nine million of them, 2% have ever invested in a private placement. Mm -hmm. So you're seeing things pop up in addition to the angel networks around the, gosh, I don't know how many of them there are in New York and Boston and everything. You're seeing companies pop up like Polywog, like Healthios, um, where you're doing this on the internet. They throw up you know, the four companies and then uh, you know, I pick and choose and you know, I can invest 20 grand here and five grand here or whatever. And I think that the Jobs Act um, enables, um, is gonna enable individual investors to play in the sector more. And if you talk about nine million people and you do some math about some percentage of them times some number of dollars, dollars can get pretty big pretty quick. So I think that um, I, th I think that that's going to be a, where more than the angel networks, I think that that's where the individuals are going to start to play more mm -hmm. on some of these portals that, uh, um, and we haven't seen it hold yet. And you know, the question for biotech always becomes, if I invest in Polywog or I invest a company Polywog puts up uh, on the internet. Um, am I going to get washed out down the road? We have to see how that plays out. But, I, but the, the, there's, a, there's a big market there for the individuals that have never bought private placements before. Yeah. Okay, we had a, 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 some questions that came in and some folks in the audience who were interested in following your footsteps. Um, and so we'll turn to that for a second. Uh, venture capital is obviously a very appealing industry for, um, uh, for people thinking about their, where to start their careers. I know in the MBA who program. Who told um, you that? <laughs> a lot of the, well, yeah, I, we know that the interest is there, whether it's true or not <laughs> is actually the question yeah, for you. Right, right, um, right. You know, in the MBA program, it's, it's obviously one of the uh, yeah. more appealing uh, outcomes for students. Yeah. I'm, I'm interested, um, what is, especially for someone like yourself who, who doesn't have a technical background, right. um, who has a, an undergrad in accounting and an MBA, um, uh, what, do you, what do you look for in your incoming analysts? And what is sort of the day-to-day -day life of, an early, of, a, of a venture investor in those early first couple of years look like? It's interesting. Um, we referenced the firm I worked at, Hambrick and Quist. And we hired a lot of people. And it was very, e not very, but it was easy <laughs> to tell who is going to be successful. Are they going to present well in front of clients? Are they articulate? Are they reasonably smart? You know, that's what the investment banking world is. Um, it's very hard on the investing world beforehand to tell whether somebody's a good investor. It's just, it's just impossible in terms of if people have the exact right credentials, everything's perfect, and they come in and their judgment is like horrible. And uh, you know, other people, it, it's the opposite. So it's, it's really hard to um, uh, beforehand predict who's going to be a good investor or not. I think that um, you know that's w one of the one of the pieces of advice I would do. We're seeing more of in New York is you know if you're interested in the f in the field, you know networking around, kind of getting to know people. It bec it does become a um, more of a personal game, if you will. We have 12 investing professionals. You know, J.P. Morgan has 100,000 employees. So, we, so J.P. Morgan can make a mistake and no big deal. They just get rid of You know, we make two or three mistakes and make a bunch of bad judgments. You know, then we're out of business. So it's, it's, um, um, it's much harder. And it's the person who, um, uh, I, I think the one thing I found is that uh, the more intellectually curious you are, no matter what your background, the better it is. And, if you, and now it's become more and more important to be able to connect the dots, you know. 
and we, you know, here's pain company A, and where does it fit into the whole ecosystem? You know, what's it mean? You know, how does what's that mean with Purdue, Frederick? What's it mean what Eli Lilly's doing? Um, you know, so and to do that requires an enormous amount of reading and keeping up with these companies, and 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 we, and we have an industry that ten years ago. Uh, um, you know, I knew pr pretty much everybody in the industry. Today, I could I walk into rooms and I, I don't know, know people. It's huge. It's huge. The industry's gotten so huge, and to figure out where to play in the industry has gotten more challenging. So unless you're networking around and figuring out, you know, who the right people are and getting some mentors and stuff like that. Um, um, but it's really the intellectual curiosity. I don't know. Um, uh, Allison, what questions were you asked when you were getting hired? Maybe you can, or, or maybe you can, maybe you can talk about the day-to-day -day life of somebody that's uh, young in the industry. Like, what do you, what do you do all day? I've been at Aisling for about two and a half years now. Prior to Aisling, I worked in healthcare investment banking at J.P. Morgan. So I did a little bit of finance and studied biomedical engineering before that. So I had a little bit of a science background, a little finance background before coming to Aisling, and that's perhaps why they hired me. Who knows? <laughs> But in terms of what I do today, so I really bucket it into four categories. So the first being doing due diligence on new opportunities. So a company comes to see us, perhaps is a, a relationship with a senior member of the team, perhaps the banker brought the company to us. We'll meet with them, decide to do more work. We might do IP work, perhaps the focus is clinical or regulatory. Perhaps there's more financial analysis, but it's a little bit later stage. So the diligence really depends on what we're working on. Um, I think the second thing that I do is work with our portfolio companies, in particular with capital raising transactions. So if they're looking to go public, if they're looking to do another private financing, I can work with the partner who sits on the board and think about creative financing structures or the impact to us in terms of investing additional money. Um, also help to kind of look at new opportunities and source deals, so whether that's going to a banking conference, um, you know, going to academic centers, speaking with people in the industry. And I'd say kind of the fourth is the other bucket, which is anything Aisley needs me to do. <laughs> <laughs> so that could be, you know, working on, you know, how we kind of structure or position our funds, how we think about our annual meeting or other things. So that's kind of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. And do you want to take one of those buckets and just talk about how we do due diligence? What do you do for when you look at a new company? Yeah, What's so, the work you do? Sure, I can take a recent company that we just looked at. So this company had phase one data and healthy volunteers. It was a drug that's being repurposed. It was originally developed at Big Pharma. They decided that that indication perhaps um, wasn't the, the best route for the drug. Decided to develop it in some orphan indications. So for us, we really wanted to look at the mechanism of action, you know, the chance that it would be successful in a new indication of the safety profile looked acceptable. So it was a lot of a lot of plan of right diligence and also a lot of talking to doctors. So we'll call a physician up, be on the phone with them, we'll be a few other people from the investment team, we'll say, you know, what's your patient population look like, what's the unmet need, how do you currently treat these patients, and then say, you know, describe the drug profile some other things, but that's kind of one example of what I do in a daily basis. And actually, I'll have got a follow-up question for you then. So between, you said you have an undergrad uh, in BME, is that right? Yeah. Okay. So um, for young scientists looking to break into the field, how important did you feel like your financial experience that you learned on the job was? Like if you were giving advice to um, undergraduate or, or master's or PhD students in the sciences, about what skill sets they should do before they apply for the job as opposed to learn on the job, what would they be? Sure. Yeah, i definitely say my experience at banking uh, was really helpful. I think that coming from a science background where all I did was kind of work in a research lab, think about chemistry and biology to understand, A, just like the industry as a whole. So who are the big pharma companies? What are they thinking about? What are trends in the industry? Um, you know, how to run a DCF. You know, what is it? Discounted mean? cash flow. Discounted cash flow. Um, you know, mm -hmm. what different valuation <laughs> techniques are and, and what the implications are for these techniques. I think it was very helpful. I think it also gave me the platform and confidence to just be in the business world. And there's an aspect of you're in academia. It's a very different world from perhaps the business world in terms of how it works, the 
um, relationships, expectations on the job, and I think that platform is also very helpful as it transitions. So in the interest of time, I think, mm -hmm. thank you, Allison, I appreciate it. Um, in the interest of time, I think uh, we have a few minutes left. Maybe okay. we'll open it up to the audience if people have questions. Um, great, and if people, if, uh, I think the room is small enough, you can probably project out, but if you could stand up and sort of address the room and maybe introduce yourself, that'd be great. Hi, I'm Ronnie Frenchie, and I work with um, an angel group, and also with some, another actor, I guess, too, and early stage funding. And my question really was, um, over the last few years, of the companies that you are investing in, how have been funded to date? Um, the, uh, the other thing that I do actually is I look at foundations that have stepped in and funded, say like we're like with J&J's Innovation Center and then a private foundation and things like that. And I'm wondering if those are the kind of companies you look at? Because people have to get early stage money from somewhere and venture right. not providing it. So. Right, right. Um, Maybe repeat, repeat the question. Yes. I think I think what you're asking is, you know, where's the best place to get early stage funding? Yeah. Um, but also, I'm curious as to what you are specifically, how you're going about thinking about it. Yeah. Well, the way I mean, one of the ways we're thinking about it, and this goes again at connecting the dots a little <coughs> bit. I was th I was thinking about it the other day. We look at cystic fibrosis company came in, pretty interesting, something new, and I started to think, why? Wouldn't I partner with the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation? They see all this. They see all the companies. They know all the researchers. They know everything that's going on. And I think that um, what we're looking for, because we're not um, at, we're, we're not full of uh, super technical people. So generally, we're not starting up companies. We're looking for somebody else that has some credibility that's around the company. Um, as I said this morning, this or new orthopedics company that has a new screw, and I wouldn't have paid a whole lot of attention to it, but all of a sudden I saw these, these guys that invested in it, and I thought, okay, you know, maybe we should take a second look at this because obviously they've been successful and, and they uh, um, provide some validation. So, you know, the, the more validation you can bring to the table, the better. I, and the, the other thing I would say about early stage and the angel investing also, is um, setting valuation expectations realistically. I see too many times you come in unsophisticated f groups or angels and it's a, they did the series A or f seed or something at a $40 million valuation and really the right number is you know 10 or 15 and all of a sudden that becomes a bit of a drill. So. Uh, I, I, I totally get how hard it is to get the first round of financing. I, I get it. But um, also, if you can, um, it's a long game, and you want to think about the next one and the next one. And, 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 and for us, the other thing about the early, sta the early stage is if you, give, if you gave me a choice of a a management team and a B rated technology or vice versa, we'll take the A management team all day long. I mean, because nothing ever works the way you expect it to work. And what I find is that the best people that are successful are the ones that can pivot when they have to pivot. And, you know, the business plans, I go back and look at the business plans that we invested in, none of them looked the way it came out. Um, That's when they the bioscience space, because I mean, pivot, you, most, people, most people associate the, the pivoting with sort of early stage high tech companies. Th yeah. Um, if, if you go back to the, you know, arguably one of the most successful, if not the most successful biotech company, Amgen, and they have two lead, <coughs> their two lead the, the comp drugs um, that made the company, uh, Nupagen and Epigen. <coughs> Excuse me. If you go back to when they went public, they were listed number eight and nine in the uh, pipeline. Number number one was some, some chicken rooster growth factor or something. And the, the the two things that made this a thirty billion dollar company were listed number eight or nine, and they were able to you know, figure it out as, 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 as they went. So for us, you know, working with the management team is really crucial. And I think that um, sometimes uh, what I see in this world is a, a, a somewhat semi-adversarial 
a ro role with management and the VCs and, and the like. And, you know, we try to just, for us, if we're all in the same boat together and we sink or swim together, that's where we want to be. And if we, and, um, and the hardest thing is for a science, you know, some people say, do we really need 3,000 biotech companies? And, you know, the answer is no, of course we don't. Um, but you have 3,000 Nobel laureates or 3,000 PhDs or 3,000 people that, you know, are firm believers and, you know, we'd love to see it. They, they're passionate about their, um, their own projects. So then when you talk about a merger, you never get anywhere because obviously my technology is better than your technology and, you know, I want to be the CEO, not you and the like. So, you know, one of the things we've done a pretty lousy job at in the industry is that, at, you know, at different state uh, phases, you need different skill sets. And a lot of the, what we have where we have CEOs that are the founding scientists, and all of a sudden, you know, they're not skilled in clinical trials, let alone, you know, down, other downstream stuff. So I think we need to be more flexible and realize what types of people, you know, f um, are the right ones at what, uh, at what uh, stage of companies at. That makes sense. There was a question here. Right. And you still have introduced yourself. Uh, my name is Shutak. I'm running uh, early stage uh, health IT company. Um, I have a question exactly how you um, said it. What is the uh, right violation, violation of a company? Because um, you said uh, angels violate company on the 40 million, but really it's uh, 10, 15 million. Again, when it's with, probably when it's 10, 15, it's easier when it's uh, between 500 and million 500. It's probably even more hard. How, what's your criteria for real evaluation? Yeah, and I, I wish, I wish uh, um, uh, it's, uh, you know, we're in, we're in a, uh, Couple deals with Blackstone. Sure. If we could just repeat the question. Yeah, I'm sorry. How you know? How do you set a valuation? How do you think about you know what's Especially the right on the, on the you know, particularly on the early stage? And we're in a couple deals with some of the buyout shops, and it's really not, not easy, but it's really kind of simple. It's we'll pay nine times EBITDA, or we'll pay eleven times EBITDA, or whatever. And the question becomes. Um, you know, how do you value these? And it's, there's no, at the beginning, well, let me, let me answer it first. We work backwards and say, how much do we have to have in this company to, and, you know, and then if we sell it at 2X or 3X, what's that mean? So if I have a valuation of 500 million after the Series C, then I got to get comfortable that we can sell for a billion five. And, you know, that's different than valuing at 100 where I have to sell it at 300. Um, so we kind of work backwards as to what might be a reasonable exit and, and, and uh, you know, we, we talk about it in kind of post-money terms. What's the post-money of the deal and can you get an adequate return on that? Um, I forget the name, the, uh, uh, there's, there's a book called Gene Dreams, which was written about this guy, David Bleck, who was a very early biotech guy. and. Um, some of the valuation metrics people used back then were fantastic. Um, uh, one valuation metric was a multiple of PhDs on your staff. <laughs> it's, a true, it's a true story, this is Wall Street. Another, another metric was a multiple of people on the payroll. Um, it, it, was, it, it was fascinating, and we, and we haven't come that much further, actually. But uh, this, this particular book, when you go back at the beginning of biotech and look at how they valued things, that, that was the thought. So, um, you know, are, are we smart enough to know whether it's 10 or 15? No, you know, and that's a negotiation. Um, what I find too much, a big mistake I find when you talk about mistakes by uh, new entrepreneurs, is that you're a country mile off. So in other words, you come in and say it's 100. And I'm like, 100? You gotta be young, know, really? And you know, it's one thing for you to come in and say, I like 15 and I like 10 and we settle at 14 or we settle at 11 or whatever. You know, but too many times and too much time is wasted. Um, people coming in with totally unrealistic valuations and the only thing I can say to them is, 
if you can get it, go get it. And then you, you know, and, and then they spend a year and they can't get it, and then they're back and they wasted a year. And you know, you knew it was, you knew it was inevitable. Um, and I understand the passion, and you want the passion, and you want the, to believe what you have is worth a lot. And it's great, but it's got to be in a band that, you know, the bid ask has to be reasonable. I, we, we do see, you know, not a lot, but sometimes people just come in and they're, they, they're just like out in outer space about what they think they're worth. And, and by the way, that tells you something about trying to work with the person afterwards. I mean, it is a marriage afterwards, you know, the CEO and the board and the like, I mean, you're... you're right. I'm going to take a question you know from the back, but if you could maybe come up to the front and so... And, for your question. Yeah, I'm Tom Xavier, Pfizer Oncology. Uh, you mentioned uh, your interest in early stage uh, life science ventures. Uh, with the uh, recent uh, success of Blaze Bioscience and Project Violet through crowdfunding, what's which ones? Uh, Blaze Bioscience and Project Violet through uh, crowdfunding. What impact do you see of crowdfunding in the life science sector? Um, and how do you see that play with angel investors? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would encourage you to take a look at, and there's about five of them, I think, the two that matter the most right now are this Polywag and Healthios. We're in early days, but I think that, um, I think there's a lot of money sitting on the sidelines with in wealthy individuals or so-called accredited investors um, that uh, they're going to play. And one of the things, one of the things that's been great in cancer, um, we just did one at a memorial, a company called Aragon, that we sold to Johnson and Johnson for a billion dollars with like seven patients and um, some of it's milestones and the like. But I, but I'm I'm encouraged by big pharma coming in earlier and buying these companies. And if we do that, and if we see more of that, I think we're going to see more individuals that are willing to play in the sector. You know, where if if, if it's a ten-year process and it's going to cost five hundred million dollars to get there. I don't know how interested individuals will be. And I think we've got time for maybe two more questions since I see two hands up. So I think you were. Uh, I like to classes. So I'm finishing up my PhD in cell develop developmental biology and also uh, working with an angel investment group that's focused on uh, life sciences here in New York. Uh, Which one? Uh, MAPA. MAPA, Mid okay. Yeah. Mid Atlantic Bio Angels. Yeah. So my question was, one of the problems that I've heard with life science investing as opposed to other sectors is that it's binary. You kind of you make a multiple or you lose all your investment. And there was an article a while back by an MIT professor, I forget his name right now, but uh, basically proposed this mega fund where you could own you know, pieces of multiple companies to mitigate your risk and share the, you know, the benefits or losses, kind of like an ETF, I guess. Uh, do you think that's feasible, or would it kind of increase your appetite for uh, for novel or risky yeah. types of business? Yeah, the guy, the guy, uh, his last name is it's a Dr. Ho, up in uh, at MIT, yes. and uh, the question was, uh, well, the issue was that uh, they put out a hypothesis that what we should do is start a twenty-five billion dollar fund diversify some of it would be debt some of it would be equity and then they ran a bunch of models that showed if we did that uh, and typical success rates blah 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 you could make money on it and therefore let's go and do one of these 25 billion dollar funds I mean I've read the article two or three times and I've talked to people I was supposed to actually meet with them last week and he canceled um, uh, you know, I, it, it, I don't think it has legs. I mean, it's intellectually interesting, but I don't think it has legs. I mean, he's, he, he's talking about putting debt on all these companies and paying an interest rate for a money-losing company. I, I think that mathematically it's kind of like interesting, but in the real world, I'm not sure. And I talked to my friends in Boston and, and asked them whether it's gotten any traction, and so far it hasn't gotten much traction. But it's an interesting article. It was in Nature a year ago? You know, about a year ago, if anybody's in there. And his, I, I believe his last name's Ho. It's interesting, though, actually, just as an aside, so even, even from the university perspective, uh, you know, the challenges that, that universities face when trying to commercialize super early stage technologies, I mean, VCs often say we invest early. And even the early stage VCs usually don't mean what universities mean when you say early, which is you've published a paper, you've got some interesting data, you know, maybe an animal model. 
<laughs> um, and so uh, all the same kind of, you know, maybe one in 10, two in 10 successes you see in the venture industry for us are, and if you look at the universities that have made real money in this field, it's like Columbia has always been in the top two or three, Stanford right. and others, UC system. It's the ratios we see are like one in a thousand of inventions that make any real return. Um, so there's, a, there's two different efforts, and I won't get into, I won't name them, but there's two different uh, consortiums that we're part of um, that have tried to capitalize on that, that, that have said, you don't know where the next hit is coming from. So all the universities that work as part of this consortium, most of the return comes from their own projects, but they actually share in some of the return from anyone else's projects as well. As well. And that's a hugely appealing model, but it works, I think, because these are small scales. So it's let's get you know, 10 to 20 universities together um, and all th you know, put something together, show opportunities into a fund that is some sort of rights. And then if someone gets the next you know, Remicade, then the re returns accrue to everybody, not just to one. But it works because everyone knows each other and there's a level of trust. It's, it, 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 I think it's a great, I, I think that, you know, we've talked about it a little bit, it's a great idea. One of the problems that we have in, in life sciences is that over half of all trials are never published. So there's no sharing. Right. So all of a sudden, you know, here's a, here's a uh, mechanism whereby if Memorial comes up with something, Columbia gets a piece of it and vice versa. It's a clever mechanism to get people to talk more and share more, right. which we don't have in the biotech industry. We don't have in the pharmaceutical industry. It's actually a crime that half the trials are never published. I mean, we just don't learn from our mis mistakes. So we'll do one more question. The, um, uh, it, it's, it, it, it's very much shifted the playing field uh, because, you know, the question was, um, you know, the IPO market and, and you know, how does that, what does that mean to the balance of power in, in the industry? Um, for the last five years, the pharma industry held all the cards because we couldn't go public. And they said, we'll give you X up front, we'll give you 4X on the back end, and, you know, what can you do? Yeah, it's a yes or a no. Now with the IPO market, there's a, there is an alternative. And the pharma guys are all complaining, saying these companies have gotten too expensive, maybe. But it gives, uh, but it gives us another exit op <coughs> option so that a Pfizer, it keeps Pfizer honest. Because if Pfizer doesn't pay us what we want or we, you know, we think it's worth, then we're going to try to take the company public. Now, um, the question is, we're, we're as well financed now as we've been in a long time. We're at a great point. The problem in this industry has been like that, you know, we've, it's been like this over 30 years. So can we get smarter this time as an industry and, not, and kind of uh, smooth out that curve? You know, we're always going to have ups and downs. But, um, you know, my, my, one of the things, you know, it's horrible. Venture capital, you do a $50 million venture deal, and nobody pays any attention to where the money's going. And, you know, I'm spending this here, and I'm taking a lease here, and I'm bringing on three chemists there, blah, 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 blah. You know, and everybody goes along with it. And then we're down to $500,000 and two weeks of cash left, and it's mass panic. So the question is, you know, even with $100 million in the bank or $50 million in the bank, can we get smarter about using that money and keeping it last longer rather than going through this boom and bust cycle that, uh, um, that we had? And, you know, the bust, the bust cycle lasts for a long time. I mean, it was six, five, six, seven years. And, uh, you know, hopefully we'll continue on for a little bit longer here, but at some stage, uh, at some stage, inevitably, it'll stop, and the generalists will move on to the next thing. But um, uh, it, it's been a big help. Okay, well, I'd like to thank uh, Dennis Purcell for joining us and his colleague Allison. So thank you very much. I'd also like to remind everybody, if you're interested in seeing more events like this, please do sign up for our newsletter. 
Uh, it's techventures.columbia.edu is where you can find the mailing list. And if you're interested, uh, also check out entrepreneurship.columbia.edu, which is where they aggregate all sorts of events related to entrepreneurship around campus and around New York City. Thank you for coming today, and thanks Thank again. You. Thank you.